We're starting a lesson in the Sermon of the Mount. Uh, we really, really will not get into the Sermon of the Mount until next week. But it's very interesting that when we study the Word of God, I make mention quite often about building pictures. And that's how I study. And the Holy Spirit's helped me to build that in my mind. So when we're looking at, like the Sermon on the Mount, there is a need of going back and bringing things up as they are. So we can understand where Jesus is coming from when he begins this Sermon on the Mount. And our lesson this morning deals with the development of what's going on. Now, I ask you to remember something with me, that God had given Israel a covenant. Matter of fact, there were quite a few covenants involved in the Old Testament. You have the Abrahamic, and you have the uh, David, you have the Noah, you have the Moses covenant. And so, when you study about these covenants, you get to Moses, and that was a man covenant given for men to do things. Matter of fact, when you study the law, you will see a lot of things that pertains to life. I don't care what it is. It's abuses, it's uh, marital, it's sexual, it's social. There's a lot of stuff in the law that when you look at it, some of it is hideous. But what God does is he exposes the Adamic nature. So when you study the law, when you study the Old Testament, you see this covenant of the law. But then you go over to Jeremiah chapter 31, 31, it says that Israel broke that covenant. And that caused God to bring a divorce between him and Israel. And verse 32 said, I'm going to give you a new covenant. And then you follow that through, and that new covenant is something that changes inside. It's no longer an outside development by our nature. Is something that happens inside. Are you following? That's called the new birth. The new covenant is all hinged upon Jesus. Just like Moses had to die for that covenant to be confirmed and enforced. Jesus not only died to shed his blood for the remission of sins, he died for that covenant, that new covenant, to be confirmed and enforced. The new covenant is not for lost people. And I, sometimes I wish we would get that into our mind. There is nothing, nothing in the New Testament that calls a lost person to live for Jesus until they're born again. Every lost individual is already sentenced. Okay? They're already sentenced. It's when the Spirit of God begins to draw and to convict and bring them to the reality of sin in their life and the Adamic nature that they cry out for God for mercy that there is something that happens inside that changes the individual. And so when you watch Israel in the Old Testament, you don't see changes. You see a worsening of their lifestyle, their attitude, until finally God said, that's it, I draw a line. And so he brought forth the new covenant, which is in Jesus Christ. Everything hinges on the New Testament of Christ. 
We suffer for his sake. We are forgiven for his sake. You go back, you go through the New Testament, look how many times that's used it for his sake. The whole focus is right there on Christ. It's never us, it's Christ. It's never me, it's Christ. So when we get into Christ and we get our focus where it ought to be, changes began to develop. But as we study the scripture and we look at these kingdom principles in the Sermon of the Mount, they are not for lost people, they're for God's people. I ask you to remember two things as we go into this. There is the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, which deals with the New Testament covenant. Okay? The New Testament covenant. Because there in chapter 13, all those parables about the kingdom is likened to this. And so here in the Sermon on the Mount, we have the rules of the kingdom. It affects every individual that is saved. But then there's the second part of that that we overlook. That's where the universalists have messed us up. Is the kingdom is all the redeemed. The church is the custodian of the truth, the custodian of the teachings of Christ. And both of these have to be kept separate. If we have a universal church and somebody says, well, I've been called and I've run into this. There was a young man standing out on the road uh, one day and I stopped and talked to him and I witnessed to him and he said, oh, he said, I'm saved. And the Lord gave me a personal ministry and I'm working to raise funds that I can go and start my own personal ministry that the Lord wanted me to do. And I said, uh, do what? I said, the Lord doesn't do that. I said, there came a time that that was okay during the apostolic time, but after the apostolic time, everything fell on the New Testament church as far as sending people out. And he didn't like that. He said, well, I got news for you. God has sent me out individually. I said, okay, do your thing. When you can't talk to somebody, you can't talk to them. But, but both of those have to keep in our mind, okay? Because when we get into the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to find that Jesus, the multitude is following. But I ask you to remember, when you're, when you're watching this multitude following Jesus, you have to realize what we're here in John chapter 6, the multitude was following Jesus. And they couldn't find him, so they went and they started traveling to find out where he was. They found him somewhere else beyond their expectations. And they said, how did you get here? And he says, you aren't following me. You aren't following me because of what I'm doing. He said, you're only following me because of the food that I give you. And so in our picture development, we're watching the multitude, and then we're watching the disciples. But then there's another side of the fence that we focus on Jesus because he's the one that says, repent and follow me. Follow me. The Apostle Paul says, you follow me as I follow Jesus. So the whole concept comes down again. We are following Jesus. And Jesus said that he was going to pray to the Father and give another comforter that's going to be just like him, that's going to come alongside as if Jesus is right here teaching us when we go into the Word of God. So here again, our focus comes down again to Jesus. What is he saying? There are some warnings in the scripture that we really don't pay much attention to. But I want you to note with me, if you will, go with me to Luke chapter 21. 
in Luke chapter 21. In Luke chapter 21, verse 34 through 36. Now listen to this morning. And take heed to yourself, lest at any time your heart be overcharged with surfeiting. That means the cares of this life. And drunkenness and the cares of this life and so that day, that day shall come on you unaware. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of God. It's quite a warning. There are so many people that are caught up in the cares of this life today that is causing psychological problems, it's causing physical problems. And I'm not going to say that when you walk with Jesus, you're not going to have any of that. Satan's going to make sure of that because he wants you to begin to doubt Christ and so forth like that. But, but it, 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 it's not on the cares of the world. And people are wondering, why isn't God blessing me? Because they're caught up in the cares of the world. Now, now you go to 2 Timothy, chapter 2 and verse 4. It started me one day when I was making a comparison, comparing spiritual with spiritual things, that Jesus told the preacher, the teachers, the leaders, not to entangle themselves in the affairs of this life. Because you're a soldier to Christ. The one that I want us to really focus on is over here in 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. In 2 Peter chapter 2, the whole chapter it, it, it's talking about individuals that are sneaking in to the fellowship of the church and what they're bringing in to the church. I'm going to go down here to verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh. I ask you to notice that. We're so prone to think about our flesh when we hurt, when we go through sorrow, we go through different uh, tribulations, we go through different things. We're so concerned about our flesh, nature, and how it's affecting me. Jesus said, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. And that's what he said, focus on me, I've overcome. And, and so when you focus on Christ, which we'll do that in a minute, he goes on and he says, A Lord is through the lust of the flesh, through much wantedness, those that were clean, notice that, those that were clean escaped from them who lived in error. Otherwise, they found out they were in error and they backed away from them. Okay, next verse. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge, you see, you can have all the knowledge of the Bible. I talk to a man that can quote scripture after scripture after scripture, but when I talk to him about being saved again, he didn't even know what I was talking about. It was all human intellect. There was no spiritual there at all. It was all human intellect. And I found this with a lot of these people that have what you call uh, intellectualism. They have a high standard of intelligence, but they have no spiritual foundation. That, that, that's what this is talking about here. They have escaped through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 
they are again entangled therein. So, so here's individuals that knew all about it, but they've never been saved. They've never come to that place. And that's where this verse is confusing. And I've read commentaries where they say that this is saved people that can lose their salvation. No, you cannot. There's a change that has taken place. You, you cannot lose your physical life only through death. You cannot lose your spiritual life. It will never die. Can I get amen on that? But these people are going to lose it all the way around. They knew the knowledge, but they got so entangled and overcame that the later is worse with them than the beginning. For if they had, excuse me, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, to see, known the right way of righteousness. I, I thank God the day that I was saved. Uh, it, it took almost a year for the Lord to bring me to that place. Because I knew some Bible. I, I was raised up in Luther and I knew some Bible. But there were things that blocked me, blocked me. And, and somebody told me, just knowing the Bible, you're saved. No. I knew enough of the Bible but I was not saved. Even though I was sprinkled in the Lutheran church, I was not saved. Even though I was grafted in Christ, I was not saved. It's when the Lord started convicting and drawing and showing me what I knew I needed to respond to. And when the Spirit of God brought me to that place, I ran to Jesus. I saw myself as God saw me, lost and condemned. If I would just let the word itself, the knowledge, be the course of my direction, I could have probably lived a good life for a while, but I'd end right back where I was again. And that's what these verses are talking about. For if they had been, it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, notice the way of righteousness, than after, than after they had known it to turn from that holy commandment delivered unto them, but it happened unto them according to the proverb, the dog turned again to his vomit again, and the saw that was washed to her wallowing in mire. So, so there, there's, there's a line. And over the years, I've had people tell me, well, I know when they were saved, no, you know, you aren't God. If there's a lot of change in their life, don't tell me they were saved. Well, you know, they're weak. Well, how long do you live in weakness? 30 years, 40 years, 50 years? Huh? Where at that point does the Holy Spirit have the tendency to draw them to the point of reality? You have to have the Spirit of God in you for the Spirit of God to bring you to the reality of living. Do I get an amen on that? So, why even think about studying this, this history before we get to uh, the Sermon Mount? Because our focus is on Jesus. Our focus is on Jesus. Your lesson pretty well exposes some of these things. I'm just going to touch on them because these are what your lesson is talking about. You don't find much about Jesus except for his birth and when he went to the temple at 12 years old. And now from 12 years old until approximately 30, according to Luke's writing, Jesus began his ministry around 30, cultural, Anyone who reached 30 years old had a right to start their own business, carpentry, whatever it might be, building ships, building tents, at 30 years old. That was a cultural thing. Jesus honored the cultural thing. He was taking care of his dad's business after Joseph died, and now he's launching out to start 
the ministry that his father has called him to do. So when you watch this picture unfold, the first thing Jesus did is walk approximately 60 miles to be baptized to John down in the Jordan. Okay? Down in the Jordan. I'm not going to go into all that. Your lesson does that. But after that, according to Mark's writing, he was driven by the Spirit of God in the wilderness of temptation. Now, isn't it true? You know, I've, I've experienced it. Many have experienced it. Some haven't experienced it because they don't know what's going on. As soon as you are saved and you identify with the Lord, Satan is going to begin to work. And he's going to try to confuse you. He's going to try to disappoint you. His whole ambition is, as he lost you to Jesus, his whole ambition is to get you stopped in your tracks that you want to grow. I've had people tell me, I'm, I, I became disappointed in God, so I quit serving. <clears throat> Where did you get disappointed with him on all that he has done? Where did you get disappointed in Christ and all that he has done? Okay. So Jesus was, was pressed into that area of temptation. Why? For us. Jesus had to be tempted in every way that we are. And even though he was tempted and he endured all of that, Satan only left him for a little while, but he started using people, people to get at Jesus. And we know who they were, for Tom and the Pharisees and so like that. John the Baptist was busy in his work. Jesus embarked in his work. And then we find that Jesus spent a lot of time in Jerusalem. He went to the temple according to the prophecy that he would appear before the temple. He went to the temple. He turned over the money changers. He was, he was literally rejected from the temple. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they didn't know how to handle him. They got very upset with him. As he was doing the work and he was teaching around Jerusalem and so forth, pressure started building, pressure started building, and you find out that they took a hold of John and, and took him to prison. Why? Listen, real quick, why? Anybody tell me why? Why was John put in prison? I'm looking for a little bit more of that. Thank you, that's correct. He rebuked the king or, the, or the, the ruler for divorcing his wife and marrying another one. You see, they had accepted Judaism. And what he did is he, he divorced his wife according to Judaism was wrong and he married somebody else. John the Baptist confronted him. You know what happened? He ended up in prison, and he ended up taking his head off. I mean, it's interesting. So paint the picture. So, so what you find when you when you begin to walk with the Lord, it's a joy, it's an excitement. But listen, pressure is going to come. This is what this sermon is all, the sermon on the mount is all about. So Jesus left that area because he knew that his ministry was in jeopardy. And went down to Galilee, went down into Capernaum, and that where he made his home. And from that time on, he began to preach a simple message, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He started uh, teaching people, preaching to people, healing people, and so forth like that. And you know this stuff of healing there, according to the lesson, dealt with physical and mental and spiritual. I did an in-depth study on that once, and I got into some interesting information. A lot of our insane, insane sort of places out there where they put insane, insane people, insane people, a lot of them should not have even existed. You know, if they would have been following God's principles, they shouldn't have been existed. Because a lot of people could have been, they, they were psychologically disturbed. They had physical problems because of their mental. And they weren't doing anything about that. They started shooting them up with all kinds of medicine and making them all 
goofy and so forth. But this, this, this book I read about none of these diseases showed that these people, if they had Christian counseling leading them to Christ and getting them to follow Christ, everything would begin to change inside out because then the heart, the new heart, affects the thinking. You know what the Bible says? Transform the renewing of your thinking. Once your thinking starts, and I get I get a call today where they say, all you have to do is think yourself in the in the good health. You know, it doesn't work that way. Okay, it doesn't work that way. I think some of us can identify with that quite a bit. We pray about it, we still have health issues we deal with. Satan's going to make sure of that. So Jesus was busy. And as these people began to follow him, he started his ministry. And that sort of brings us to our lesson today that he began there in Capernaum where he started calling out. According to your lesson here, your key verse here uh, simply deals with preaching. There's two things that, that surface in, in this lesson, the next uh, from B, A, and B, is teaching and preaching. I'm, 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 I'm a Paul. I've been uh, in the ministry for a long time. My grandson, when I turned 81, somebody asked him how old he thought Grandpa was. He said, very old. <laughs> I've been in the ministry a long time. I pastored some churches. And a couple of those churches, as a matter of fact, just about all of them except one, said, I need to be in the seminary teaching, which I was a seminary college. They said, that's where your teaching belongs. It doesn't belong in the church. Where does the teaching and the preaching belong? Seminaries were established by preachers and churches until humanism got into it and took that all the way from the churches. You follow me? Jesus was preaching and teaching. We need to hear the word of God. And I'm amazed at how many people do not study. They do not have their devotion time. All they do is think. They don't compare their thinking with the word of God. And so we get all called up. There's some that don't even come to Sunday school because they don't need Sunday school. I think it's the best thing for anybody to sit in Sunday school and learn. Learn. We used to have Sunday school at BTC. Two learning tools, participation, learning tools, question and answers. Now it's hard to get anybody to answer or even respond to a question. Are you following me? So Jesus was, was teaching and he's preaching and his whole message was repent and follow me. And you'll find that periodically throughout the scripture. Even when he told Peter, follow me. Told his disciples, follow me. Okay? In B we find the key word that is, is, uh, is teach. And here it talked about uh, the culture background. And the culture background was a rabbi, a teacher. And Jesus was more than that. He was God in flesh. He would go and he would sit down. And his disciples would come and kind of form a circle around him, partial of a circle, and he would begin to teach them. Now, if you pay real close attention to the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, turn there with me, Matthew chapter 5. Learn how to read it without yourself, okay? Read it. Or exactly what it's saying, and it will take a lot of confusion out. And seeing the multitude, the multitudes were following him, so I'm not going to go back into that because we've seen those two, two frames in our picture of the multitudes. So the multitudes were following him, and he went up into a mountain that simply means a hill slope, okay, and was sat. That's what a rabbi does. Now, look, 
Ghost, his disciples came to him. A disciple is a learner, not just a follower. There's, there, there's a critical point that Jesus made mention over in Luke chapter 14 that if you're going to follow him, you can't let anyone or anything interrupt the process. You have to hate your mother, you have to hate your father, you have to hate your sister, you have to do this and that. And the human flesh, when you study the Sermon on the Mount and you study certain things in the Bible, your human nature is going to recoil. Your human nature is going to cause a hissing in your life. It won't be able to stand it. And I've had people say, I'm not going to live that kind of life. Because a certain amount tells me just to give in. <laughs> no, 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 no. It tells you to put your focus where your focus needs to be. Because it's not going to have anything to do with your flesh. It's going to contradict your flesh nature. And it's going to set in spiritual principles of trusting, obeying, and following Jesus Christ. Our lesson talks about cause and effect. Cause and effect under the second part. And the cause and effect that takes us to our lesson because our lesson is talking about beginning at the end. So we go to the end of of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, verse 24 and 29, we see the cause and effect of hearing, listen, hearing and doing. If I hear and I don't do, I have a problem, right? If you sit here and hear, and you don't make the application and apply it and do it, you're just a hearer. And we just read over in 2 Peter what hearers did. Okay? What hearers did. It didn't help at all. We have to be hearers and doers. One of your writings there is therefore, we have to understand what the therefore is, that's why we spent some time there dealing with the process of Jesus coming along. But the hearing and doing is the important thing. I want to back up here a little bit. You have it in your, in your book. The key word for preaching means to proclaim a message with the intent of persuading. That's what preaching is all about. That's what Paul Talk about knowing the terror of God, we persuade men. And then you go along and, and you start studying other things like teach. It means to impart knowledge or uh, disseminate, disseminate information. That's all I can do. I can stand up here, Mark can stand up here, and Brother uh, Bob can stand up here. And all we can do is give, give the word. Give the word. Give the word. We can't take the word. I remember in class one day, uh, a student said, man, I wish I could learn that. And Brother Johnny Paul Johnson said, well, I wish I could just open up the top of your head and put it in your brain, but I can't. <laughs> he said, you have to put it in and allow the Spirit of God to work it out. And that's what it's all about. Knowledge comes in. The doing is what makes the application of applying and carrying it out. That's why these two are very important. The cause and effect is hearing and doing. If you notice there in the later part of chapter uh, 7, he talks about these and he, he says this. Verse 24, therefore, whosoever heareth, I will liken him to a wise man. So I'm going to stop right here for a minute and have us focus on a wise man. Okay, now listen, please. 
when I was lost, please, I was the child of my father, my dad. My dad was a woman. I'm sorry. We, we had nothing from my dad. We got nothing from my dad. I also learned after I was saved, I was groomed to be a child of the devil. That's, that's tough to get a hold of, folks. Jesus told the Jews that had all the knowledge, you are of your father, the devil. You see, we don't want to grab that. I had to. But in the new birth, I became a child of God. Amen? It wasn't me. It wasn't of blood. It wasn't the will of the flesh. It wasn't the will of man. Even though people witnessed to me, they had a desire. They couldn't save me. Only God. I, I get a call when people say, I run five people to the Lord. No, you did not. You witnessed the five. If they're saved, it was God who did it. Are you following me? Because there's a new birth that took place inside. Only He can do that. Are you following me? That's why we're so confused today. There's people are running around. There was a preacher out north. He was bragging. He witnessed a 30 son and one 30 son to the Lord. His congregation never grew. And I said, if you want them, where are they? Later on, I was up in that area, and a guy told me that, that uh, this preacher won him to the Lord, and he was just like him. Okay, I know where that came from. <laughs> but here it said, the wise person, turn about with me to James. The book of James. In the book of James, chapter 3, first of all. In chapter 3, look at verse 13. You see, we are to compare spiritual things with spiritual things according to Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 15. We are to compare. But we have our own natural spirit, and then we have a divine spirit. Too many times we're following our natural spirit. That's what causes us problems. We don't compare spiritual things by the spiritual. Okay? So look at this verse of me. Who is a wise man and great person and endure, in, in, endure with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Now, now, this verse right here tells us something. They have the knowledge and they have the application. What has caused the application is the later part. The meekness, the meekness of wisdom. Meekness means to train a wild horse, a wild horse to put a bridle on it and a saddle on it and take it out for a ride and it begins to to follow your directions. You can just drop the reins to a certain degree and the horse will turn. You can drop a rein this way and the horse will do that. Up in, uh, in, in Barren Springs where they have the horse competition, you learn that, that they can just touch a part of and that horse will turn or do this or do that. That's what meekness is all about. So it's the Spirit of God that takes the Word of God to us and we start to apply to that and the Holy Spirit begins to get us to the point that we are listening, that we are applying, and we're putting in practice those things that God wants us to do. Are you following me? He goes on, he said, but if you have bitter envy and strive in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. If any of these fall in your life and you're responding towards those, don't tell me you're a Christian. You're telling me that you're being influenced by the evil one to do these things. Because he's going to use you, if he can, to sift you 
that you can give somebody else an occasion not to believe in Jesus because you are a hypocrite. Are you following me? Did I say all that? Verse 14. But verse uh, 15. This wisdom, I read that one. Verse 16. For where envy and strive is, hmm, where envy and strive is, or strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. I ask you, who produces that? The Adamic nature and Satan. The Adamic nature and Satan. Don't lie when it's happening. Well, I had my rights. I, I find out that I have been bought with a price. I, 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 don't, I don't own myself. Jesus owns me. Are you following me? Jesus owns me. I've been bought with a price. I've been, been taken out of the slave market. I've been set free only to serve him and love him and apply his word to my life. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Then Jesus said, I leave peace with you, I give it to you. And then Paul wrote in Colossians 3, let the peace be the umpire, the ruling principle in your life. Uh, first, I mean, uh, James chapter 1 goes on down here and he says, well, let's see. Okay, verse, uh, verse 22. Let's look at verse 21. Wherefore, lay aside all filthiness and superfluity and lightness, and receive with him the meat. Meekness, the engrafted word, there's that word meekness again, the training process going on with uh, the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. You see, your soul is connected with your mind. It has to be reformed. Okay, let's go on. But be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what matter of man he was. Remember, we touched on forgetfulness back in the Old Testament. We're guilty of the very same thing because we are not doers of the word. We look in God's mirror. We forget and we walk away. And that is not good. We are to always be standing in God's mirror, see what God shows us, and then set the pace to try to correct what He has showed us. Always going back to the mirror, and here is the mirror. Three churches I pastored that I preached on total hereditary depravity, showing that in the human nature there is nothing good, zero. The only good that could ever produce out of a person is that which comes from the Holy Spirit and that person has to be born again for that to happen. Three churches wanted to vacate the pulpit. That's right. They didn't want to hear it. I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear it. God's people have to hear it. God's people have to see it. God's people have to understand it. Because if you are a child of God, you're a part of that kingdom, that new covenant, that new kingdom that Jesus is establishing. Okay? You're a part of it. If you're a church member, you are literally set aside from the world and the world system and the world's order to follow him. Because Satan is the controller of this world. He's the prince of power of the air. He's the God of this world. So if we become concerned with the affairs of this life, we are nothing good.
good for God. All we will show is confusion, wrong attitude. But if we're sincere in our salvation, sincere in our relationship with God, we are going to make tough, tough choices. And the Sermon on the Mount is going to spell out a lot of these tough, tough choices. And when you look at it, your human nature is going to scream bloody murder because we are too prone to think this way. Oh, how I love me. Oh, how I love me. No. Oh, how we love Jesus. You follow me? Any comment? Uh, Brother Barber was going to have a tough time next week. <laughs> but he's going to have a lesson next week. I'll be back at three words. Pray for that. Pray, pray that they find a pastor. Because uh, I'm doing a feel the Lord wants me to do to help them, but yet at the same time I miss being here. You follow me? So Brother Barber and I work on this. All right. Any other comment? If not, we bow our heads in the word of prayer. Father, would you dismiss us, please? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today, Father. We just thank you for the lesson this morning, Father. May we just uh, apply it to our hearts, our lives, Lord, and, and uh, help take it out to this, this world, Father. Lord, uh, again, please uh, be with the prayer request, Lord, ones that are sick, ones that are dealing with injury, and uh, Father, just be with us in this next hour. May the service be pleasing to you. Lord, forgive us for we fail you in Jesus' name. Amen.